For Wrestle Reunion, I'm Scott Hudson, and it's an honor to be sitting with Kevin Nash, a man who has at times been one of the most controversial, one of the most beloved figures in professional wrestling. And Kevin, when we do shoot interviews, it's almost following the format. Well, tell me about your background and blah, 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 blah. But when it comes to Kevin Nash, we know the background. We know basketball. We know Oz. We know Vinny Vegas. That's not what we're paying to see here. Let's start off with your run as Diesel in the World Wrestling Federation mid-90s. If you could tell us a little bit about that run. You had come from WCW and gotten the break in New York. Yeah, funny story is, is you know, they weren't using me at all at WCW, and uh, uh, Shawn Michaels had talked to Robbie Steiner, who just came out there that was a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. and uh, said he wanted to, he liked the Vinny Vegas character and thought maybe he'd be a good bodyguard because the guys weren't selling for Shawn, and he needed like a heater. So... Um, at the time, I was with uh, I was traveling with Barry Windham a lot, who was who was office at WCW, and I just told him I said, you know, "My wife, you know, she's just going to leave me if I don't get out of the business." <laughs> so I know I had an offer on the other end, but I had to get out of my contract. And I was so valuable to WCW that only the next day gave me my release. Wow, it took him that long. Yeah, huh? it took him uh, <laughs> as long as he could take the pen. And then uh, actually, I, I started uh, that's that next Sunday we were in Albany, and. Uh, Sean wrestled Giannetti, and then that Monday we beat Giannetti for the IC belt mm -hmm. with my help, and then I went from there. But uh, did did you did you know Sean before that? No, before that no, run? not at all. And when you got there, uh, obviously they put you with Sean, like you said, right. fast friendship developed. Yeah, we you know, it was one of those deals where just uh, uh, the schedule we had at that time. I mean, was was basically you know, 21, 25 days on, four or five days off. Mm -hmm month after month, you'd work 300 days a year, and, you know, it was me, Sean, and Scott Hall just in the car every day, just day in, day out, and, you know, they, when I came in, those guys had incredible heat, everybody hated Hall and, and Michaels, and it just, like, when they brought me in, it was almost like a shoot, where, like, I was the heater that kind of kept the heat off those two guys, and... You knew Scott Hall from... I knew Scott, yeah, I, I, know, I know Scott, yeah, I'd known Scott for almost three years prior to that in yeah. WCW, we drove up and down the road together, so... And uh, kind of formed the uh, the first uh, kind of click faction there. The three of us kind of just did what we you know, always were together. Let's talk about that because you're, you're talking about the Diesel, Razor Ramon, Shawn Michaels, three of the the three top guys back back in that period. So you wielded a lot of power in the WWF. Yeah, it, it, it started off that Shawn Shawn and, and Scott wrestled against each other for uh, probably 18 months. And had some classic, and then I, I and I, you know, and I got a chance to sit ringside and watch, you know, watch mm -hmm. these guys work, watch them, be able to actually listen to them call when things got fucked up and things like that, and learn basically how to work before I ever had to get in the ring. I, you know, I just I, through osmosis, I just watched two of the better guys. Probably, I think Sean's probably the best athlete ever, but you know, I think Scott was always underrated because Scott was sure. Scott was incredible. Scott could work against the small guy. Scott could work against the big guy. So, um, you know, I got a chance to, 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 to kind of learn from, from probably my era's two greatest workers. And there'll be a lot of people that'll argue that, but not with me. And, uh, you know, then somehow Sean had some bogus drug deal that they said he was on steroids, and the only thing he was on was, was beer. <laughs> <laughs> Bloated like a toad, but... He get his money back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think he weighed about 250 then, and uh, uh, I, I you know they, they suspended him, and he got pissed off and kind of walked, and they threw me in, in that role, and I ended up fighting Scott for two or three months, and they ended up putting the IC belt on me, and then Sean came back, and it kind of we went from there. But for the better part of three years, that three guys kind of worked in some form or fashion against each other. You had a run as world heavyweight champion for the WWF. Yeah. That's all you want to say. <laughs> well, it's just one of those things, you know, that, that you know, a, a persona gets over that's kind of a badass. It's just kind of a no-nonsense guy. And then, you know, I, it's, it's like anything else that they do. It, it's like when the Road Warriors, you know, the Road Warriors sure. were the biggest badasses, and all of a sudden, you know, they walk out of the other locker room, and they became vulnerable and started selling like Steamboat. And the people, mm -hmm. piss, you know, they, people shit on it. That's not what they want to see. No, and I mean, my character got over, and... To be in a certain way, and uh, 
the first time you see me, I'm singing with the uh, rest of the, the office staff, we wish you a Merry Christmas with a, with a Santa hat on. <laughs> I mean, it's just like... Not, not very intimidating, I don't think. No, and it was one of those situations where at that point, you know, I mean, you know, Vince McMahon is like Steinbrenner. I mean, you know, if he tells you to do something, you don't question it. And as, as time went, went on, I realized that he was really still kind of based in that red, white, and blue good guy thing. I remember sitting in his office one time, and this is when I told him what I wanted to do when I was going to drop the belt to, uh, to Brett. I told him, I said, you know, I said, I think that, that the way this is going is the anti-hero. I said, that's where, where your baby face is going to be. And he said, I, I disagree. And I said, did you see the movie Heat? And he said, yeah. And I said, at the end, I said, did you want Pacino to win, to go over, or did you want De Niro? And he goes, fuck De Niro. I said, he was the heel. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me like, and then I think that the diesel persona at the end of my run there was way more over than the diesel that was the champion because he, he had that attitude and then basically they took that character and, and transformed it and gave the same entrance to Steve. Mm -hmm. You know, basically the same, Steve became kind of the same character, glass break, the only thing was it wasn't a horn, I mean he kind of, so I, I think psychology wise I think I was on to something there and then it, it worked when we went to uh, when we went to Atlanta, the invasion, we basically did the same thing. At some point during your run there, let's jump back a little bit back to New York, um, with you and Sean and Scott, throw Hunter in there, and yeah, X-Pac. Yeah, I got through a kid in there. And, and, and that, no matter how you slice it, that's power. That's five of the most powerful and most talented guys in the company who have each other's back and looking out for each other's best interests. You, you guys rule the roost. Well, the thing that, that, that Vince had had at that time was, you know, that it was always this, this secretive payoff p procedure where mm -hmm. a guy would get a payoff and then, you know, it was like, it was like playing, you know, the, 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 you know, poker where the, everybody did the, you know, what'd you get and on your business, what'd you get? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. We were the first guys that got in the car and went, what'd you get for SummerSlam? Oh, fuck, I got fucked. I remember time, one time in Survivor Series, me and Scott worked the whole match. Sean came in and super kicked me. I got 35 grand. Sean got like 75. Per super kick, not a bad deal. Yeah, so we called up Vince. We said, hey, you know, what, what's going on? He said, well, I, I, I didn't do the payoffs. You'll have to. At that time, I think JJ was the heat magnet. And <laughs> they dumped it in Jerry. Well, it must have been an oversight. You know, then you get your, the trickle down. But it's like anything else. If, you know, if you didn't talk, you didn't know. And certain, certain guys. Um, I remember one time I was in the office and I had a pass key. This would be a good, this would be a good shoot story that nobody will know in that office. But um, I, I went in there, I did the James Bond where I took, I took the box tape and put it on Ann Russo's door so when she shut her door at night it wouldn't lock. Right. I went back in, I worked out, I knew where the pace stubs were, I went into her office, turned on the light, I pulled out the thing and then there was the, the payoffs for like the last 60 towns. And I was on top, and I went through, and I looked, and Taker made more than me, and Brett made more than me, but I had the strap. So I just said to myself, I said, all right, I see how it goes. Hmm. Is, was that the beginning of... That was the beginning of the... I mean, it's one of those deals, like, obviously he didn't... I'm hoping the statute has run on that, that B&E, by the way. But... It wasn't B&E because I had access. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me an access card. But uh, I knew what the payoffs were, so after that I knew. I said, okay, it isn't what it is. You know, everybody. There is no, there is no system. So when Bischoff offered Scott a deal, and Scott took it, and then you know Bischoff basically said, "I'll mirror that deal for your buddy Nash." And Nash will come. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew in dollars and cents. I mean, what we were being paid working 300 days. I'm thinking they're going to let me get this right. They're going to pay us more and work half as many days. How could you turn that down? I got a wife that's eight months pregnant. Which leads us to Madison Square Garden. Right. Tell us about that night. Well, Scott and I gave our notices, and uh, we, wanted, we went out. I mean, we were smoking hash on the bus in, in Europe. I mean, we broke every well, rule that you could. We're going straight through the statute here. With, uh, you're up to about 40 years in the pen there, Scott. Uh, Kevin, let's. Yeah. This is a work, man. I'm sorry. Well, you got to remember, this shit's all a work. You don't know what's true and what's not true. At the Garden, the big night. Big night, Scott and I did, hash in the did smoke a little something on the way to the building. Thought it'd be a good idea, maybe do a little curtain call. 
you know, this last time, and then we said, you know, it was click, you know, it, it was, Sh Sean wrestled uh, me in the main event, and uh, Hunter wrestled Scott in the semi-main event. During Scott's match, they yelled that you sold out, you sold out to Scott, the garden crowd did. And then earlier in the day, Sean had ran it by Vince, if it was okay if we all kind of went out at the end and kind of said goodbye as, hmm. as a foursome, and he didn't have a problem with it. All right. And, uh... You know, Briscoe had came to me earlier today and said, you know, you still work for this company, damn it, Vince wants to talk to you, it's over. So we set up a, a dinner at Smith & Walensky's where we were all going to go to Smith & Walensky's. And I had always said, told Vince that if he matches, you know, if he matched Turner's offer, I was going to stay. I mean, it was just, you know, and the thing is about, about what we do, I said, you know, it's called the business, but as soon as you treat it as a business, then you're fucking jack off, yeah. you know. Yeah. You know, as long as it goes towards them, then fine. But if you treat it as, as, as a true business, you know, I mean, I've got a, I've got a, a pregnant wife, and you know, and Vince is looking at me saying, you know, I, th I thought we were family. I'm like, dude, my family's sitting at home. Mm -hmm. You may not realize it because I'm only there six days a year, but you know, they are sitting at home. <laughs> so we uh, we had the main event, and Sean, you know, super kicked me and. And at one point, I told them, you know, that they, they brought cameras and stuff. I told them, I said, you know, you're not bringing cameras to guard, you're not going to replay this while I'm up there, because they never had cameras at house shows. Right, right. I told Vince, I said, you bring cameras to, you bring cameras. I said, I see one camera. I said, I'm going to knock your boy out, and I'm going to walk through with you. I'm going to walk through with your belt and walk down their TV with your belt. And at one point, I had Sean down the corner and walked all the way to the, to the, boy. to the, door and just looked back and just waved and smiled and walked back and I know they were shitting. Like, oh, this prick's going to walk through the door. But I would never do that to Sean. Sean knew right. that. Right. So we ended up, you know, Sean beat me and then uh, Scott came down and basically we did a thing at the end, which most people didn't catch, where we're Hunter and Sean kind of circled off one way mm -hmm. and then we circled off the other way like, you know, like it was, you know, the war was on. Right, right. We went to the corners and did the thing and I mean, there were people crying in the crowd, I mean, because that was our home back then. Yeah. And people can say what they want to say, that Kevin Nash didn't draw, he didn't do this, he didn't do that. But all I know is when I, the first night I went to the Garden in 1993, we did a $106,000 house, and that night it was 330. So Speak for themselves. The, the business was better when we left than when I got there. So and, Hogan, and Hogan and everybody was there, Hogan and Randy and everybody were there when I got there, so... Well, you've got, yeah. you've, you've got the standoff in the ring. Got the standoff in the ring, so we, you know, we get done and we all hug. and It's emotional as hell for us because in this business, you could be best of friends. And as soon as you, at that point, too, as soon as you cross those lines, they're running. You know, especially the New York guys, you're going to lose touch with them. Yeah. You may talk to them once or twice a month on the phone, but you're going to lose touch to them. The simple fact is they're running so hard. Yeah. And we were still running WCW. We were still running 180 shows then. I mean, we were running. So it's just like, you know, when you, when you leave, it's like basically, the, you know, the scene in Platoon when the black dude looks down at those guys and waves goodbye as he leaves Sheen and the other guy, you know, down in, down in, the, in the shit, you know. It's just, once you left, you knew, so it was emotional for us. I mean, we were four really, really close friends. And we come back through and Vince just, you know, Vince was just, he was livid. And... Now this, you said something earlier that Sean had actually. Asked Sean had him. talked to him. I was in the room when we were this going. Sean, Sean Michaels. Sean Michaels. Yeah. Sean Michaels had talked to Vince in that little meeting room that was, you know, that was Vince's office there. And he, I mean, he kind of, you know, he didn't say no. He, he, I mean, he didn't say yeah, do it. He was just like, yeah, whatever. Hmm. But then when I think when it transpired, you know, and of course we broke kayfabe because at that point, fucking nobody knew it was fake. <laughs> you know, up until then, whew. I know they had me when I was eight, but, uh, <laughs> fucking jack-offs. All right, all right, so Vince is furious. Vince, Vince is furious. Needless to say that we end up at the strip joint Lookers and not Smith and Walensky's. But, uh, and we went our own way. And then I still had, uh, I think I still had In Your House with Sean left, right? Mm -hmm. I think I still had the one pay-per-view where, where Sean, where to put Sean over it in your house. But I remember, you know, Vince, when I sat down with Vince, I said, okay, obviously you're not going to come to agreements. I said, I, I, said, I, said, I, I, I want to go out and I want to do this right. I said, I owe Taker, you know, I'll do a job for Mark mm -hmm. and I'll do a job for, for Sean. 
on the way out. And he said, I'd like you to do a job for the Ultimate Warrior on, on Raw. And I said, if he can beat me in a shoot, then he can, he can get a win. But he said, okay, then we won't have that match. I said, but I, you know, I said, you know, Mar Mark, you know, I'd, I'd watched Mark bro work with broken ribs mm -hmm. for, for months with a crushed, you know, crushed eye socket. So, I mean, I've always had uh, an incredible uh, amount of respect for, for Mark. So I said, you know, I'll, I'll, for take, I'll do anything. For Sean, I'll do anything. But anybody else, fuck them. You know, I'm leaving. And... I don't know anybody anything, and but those two guys I owe. And I did I did a job for Mark at WrestleMania, and did uh, a job for Sean in uh, Omaha and left. Scott had already gone. Scott would Scott Scott had left. His date was the was June sixth. Mine was June twelfth. I think that or maybe he was May twenty seventh. I was June sixth. It's a two week difference between our our departures. The Monday Night Wars were going full throttle. Scott Hall made his debut on Nitro that night and cut that immortal promo. Right. You know who I am, right. and you know why I'm here. You know where I came from. Right. Prompting the buzz throughout wrestling that not, people that knew that it was a work and the smart fans and whatnot knew what was going on, but they thought maybe this angle is going to be something like an invasion angle, right. that the WWF is going to invade WCW. And WCW, for once, not missing the boat, never really said. So it looked, for all intents and purposes, like the WWF was invading us. Well, you know, when Eric laid it out for, for me and Phoenix, you know, he laid this angle out. And, I, you know, and I'd seen some of the Japanese invasion angles that they had sure. done from company to company. And I thought, mm -hmm. fuck, it's kind of been done. It's, it was kind of old. But then Eric kind of laid it out, you know, and... I said, well, there's only going to be two of us. The funny thing is, you know, like Eric, you know, would, would always, when we were kicking their ass, would be put in WCW. Oh, yeah, you know, like, what a great company this is. And I said, you have to realize, Eric, that when this angle started, two guys from New York held your whole company off, and everybody believed it. You know? It doesn't say much for what he no. brought, what was there before it you wasn't got there. I mean, it just, that, that was the perception of New York. And, uh... Originally, Sting was supposed to be the third guy that joined us. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked to Eric, and I really pitched the fact that I thought that Hulk should be the one. And I laid out a finish to him. I said, you know, bang, 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 he, he drops a leg on the other guy. The finish that we end up doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, I don't think Hulk will do it. And Eric persuaded Hulk, you know. And Hulk saw it. You know, Hulk was doing that movie with, like, Lonnie Anderson and the guy from the Man from Uncle, whatever the fuck his name is. Ooh. Vaughn, somebody, not yeah. Vince either. <laughs> Robert Vaughn. Robert Vaughn. Mm. Not Elia Koryakin, but the other guy, no, no. right? The, so, <laughs> so, so off we go. You're, Scott's yeah, in. And, you're and, in. And Hulk's, and Hulk's smart enough to see that the, the trains leaving the station. Yeah. The last thing Hulk's going to do is miss any opportunity. To, I mean, people will say to me, "Who's the greatest worker ever in this business?" And I say, without a doubt, without even a, a question, Hulk Hogan. It's a different definition of work than what most would be thinking. To me, it's, to me, we're not, you know, people say, you know, define work. If you're in a business that's completely bogus, nobody's hitting a curveball, nobody bats 300, nobody scores 40 points, nobody gets rebounds, nobody tackles anybody, the only way you beat somebody is, to, is because somebody in the back tells you to lay down. To me, the definition of work is, in, in this, that situation, whoever makes the most money. And then by that definition, there is no question. Hulk's one, Rock's two. I, I would agree with you. I mean, that's that's the way I look at it. Austin, and Austin, I mean, Austin's real close. I don't know what, what, but if you put Rock's movie money into it, I think Rock, you know, but it's Rock and Steve are, 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 are probably two. Yeah. You know, but I mean, Hogan is, and then, and then Hogan, you know, everybody says Hogan can't work, but I watch Hogan come back at 49 and at 50, and still two WrestleManias, one with Rock, one with McMahon. Absolutely. So at that point, when, when Hulk is going to be the third member of the NWO, his heel run, such as it had been, ended in 1980 before his run at the top. Right. So by, for 90% of the fans or more, he had always been the uber babyface Hulk Absolutely. Hogan. So that's, I mean, you're talking about a face shot and a body blow, NWO growing, Hulk's turning heel. Yeah, I mean, that was, and the thing was that, you know, those, those Scott and I were stars. I mean, we're nowhere the magnitude that Hulk was, so what Hulk gave us that instant credibility. We're I talking mean, Great American Bash, or Bash at the Beach, right? Bash at the Beach, 1996. Yeah, Daytona Beach. 
which I now have still home. So the, the, the genesis of the NWO is still my home. <laughs> Damn it. Um, but, uh, yeah, when, when, Hulk, when Hulk joined us and, uh, and jumped aboard, I mean, then it was one of those deals where, you know, that night when they, they, they threw all that garbage in the crowd, a guy hit the ring. And I said to myself, I said, wow, I said, we got like that old, like that, they, that the old timer said, that boy, you got that white heat. <laughs> got real quiet for a minute. It sure did. And it did. It just, it was, it was something special. When Eric laid it out for you and Scott, I assume, was the NWO as a name and an organization and the logo and all that? No, that, that, that all transpired. You have to realize that I think, I think some of the beauty, like people, people would always say, you know, uh, especially the early nitro days i mean it was like a fucking torpedo drill you were there mm -hmm. i mean it'd be 745 and we'd have one segment ready i mean we'd be going on the air with one segment done i can remember vividly getting format sheets to right as day. as it went on so i mean it, i think the beauty of i think that's one thing that's missing right now is you know i think the vince's show is still i mean it's it, it is what it is but i mean it's it should be monday night contrived it's it's, it's this unraw and un it's the most canned live show that you'll probably guys don't get bullet points guys get scripts guy i mean it's just and i know that a lot of it's young talent but there's a lot of young talent out there that's got a lot better things today i i said i don't understand how you can have a room full of people that have never been fucked and never been in a fight write a show about sex and violence i don't see how that works maybe i'm wrong <laughs> obviously not since fucking the business is in the shitter but you know. Uh, back to 96. Okay, we're we back go. to 96. Great American Bash. Yes. And for my money, still one of the best pay-per-views ever uh, from Baltimore, where you power-bombed Eric Bischoff right. through the stage. Right. Take us back there. Um, we are looking for something impactful, and, and that was Eric's idea. Mm -hmm. And Ellis set up the stunt, and, uh, you know, I stuck him through the thing, and it was, man, it was a, it was a good... I mean, I watched his, I watched his knees, you know, land on each side of his head when he went through it. And I didn't see him. I didn't see him, you know, to that night in the hotel room. I walked, I knocked on the door and walked in. And he hugged me, and he said, "Man," he said, "You know," he said, I, "I think we really got something." I said, "You think?" How long after that did Eric join up? Because at that point, Eric was towing the company line. You guys are ruining the sports. You're going to kill us. Blah blah blah. You hit the power bomb. Eric's almost, you know, the most top baby face in the company. After right. that, when did he turn and come back around to your side? It wasn't very long. It was, it was almost one of those deals. I'm going to make a reference that we were when we were off air. You know, if, if you had Jenna Jameson on the bed on all fours, and they could, how long before you fucking join in the party? I mean, it was <laughs> one of those deals. Like, I want in on that. You know, don't blame him. <laughs> and and, and I assume it's a rhetorical question, but please go on. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's one of those deals. Like, it was red hot. I mean, it was. You were. I mean, the minute that you know, the minute you got those those colors, it was like. Phew. I mean, who, who developed? Whose idea was it? The NWO logo, which was such a. a I big want to part. think that that was Craig Leathers. I think Craig. I think I think Craig got that. Uh, you know, developed that logo, um, because I know that when we all talked about a logo, we said you know it has to be something that non-wrestling people will wear. Yes. You know, like the worst selling T-shirt in the world is some guy's face. I mean, that just never works. You know, and so, I'd, and they, you know, God bless them, man. Craig, Craig picked a winner. Between the logo and the uh, porno music, the porno music, and the uh, the Neil Pruitt voiceover, you know, right. the following announcement has been paid for. Those, apart from the fact that we've got Kevin Nash and Scott Hall and Hulk Hogan as heels running the company, that brought in casual fans. You know, oh, what's that? If I'm flipping by, you know, doing plus the it was that surrealism of of a, of a, you know, we were black and white. Yep. I mean, we we did our things black and white. We bought. We actually bought time. We actually, we actually for somebody. We, even though, I mean, you know, when you go to the movies and and you, and, and you see uh, the Matrix. I mean, you know, it's Keanu Reeves in a movie. You know, Fishburne's in the movie. But if they can make you just in disbelief for an hour, two hours, if you can do it for four or five minutes in a wrestling match, that's all people are looking for. So they're when you're buying time, then it it, it it tells you why you're there. And, we would have tape shows, and they wanted us to wrestle on these tape shows. And we're like, if we're invading you guys, wouldn't you just edit us on a tape show? Yeah. Good. I mean, would you not edit us from a tape show? And they said, well, how do we use you guys? I said, we'll buy time and have empty arena matches. 
we'll commentate ourselves and we'll, we'll wrestle these it guys. Was a classic. And, right, until we called some guy uh, Bud Smokey Green and the people at the turn said, no more drug references, we've got to <laughs> shut this thing down. <laughs> Who was next? You and Hulk and Scott. And I, but before, I'm sorry. DiBiase, was DiBiase next? I think he may have been. It was DiBiase, then the fourth was, um, the fourth was the Giant. Let me hit one thing. Sure. When you guys first came in, just you and Scott, I can remember vividly having production meetings where we were told, do not call him Big Daddy Cool, do not call Scott the bad guy, certainly you can't call him Diesel and Razor. Well, what do we call him? We don't know. Right now, for, for like a month, and you remember, this man Hall and this man Nash. That's right. all we could call you. Not and then Gene, Gene was the one at, at actually ba at the Great American Bash that said, you, you inner loopers, you, you outsiders. Gene came up with that phrase, which right. basically when we walked through the curtain, I looked at him, I said, I said that was pretty sweet, that outsider thing. That was, that was Gene Oakland that came up with that. Good. Um, that Gene came up with that, and, uh, but it was, but to me, like Hall and Nash was kind of like Hall and Oates. It had a, and, and we had just went through all that bullshit. I'll tell you a funny story. When Scott and I, you know, when we first came in, there was, you know, I, I don't think, like, we were getting so much heat on the baby face on a daily basis. The baby face, we could hear him. I remember one time the Target Center, Sting and Luger saying, what the fuck? These guys are killing us every week. They beat us up. They leave us laying. And, you know, Sullivan was booking at the time, and Sullivan's philosophy was it was like a hot air balloon. You got to get heat in it, get heat in it, get heat in it, get it to rise before you let air out of it. You can't let, put air in it, drop it, let. He said you'll never get this this balloon off the ground. He mm -hmm. says you know you got to. And, and God bless Sullivan, man. He could book heat. I'll tell you that. I mean, he. Yeah. I mean, Sullivan was was instru highly instrumental in, in that NWO success because he believed in, in in heat and he knew that people would wait and wait and watch and watch for the baby faces to make the charge. So that next Monday. And they would watch the show back and forth. Ross came on and said that next next Monday, Diesel and Razor Ramon would be on on their show. Mm -hmm. So, mm. you know, I go home and my my my, my at that time my, my pager my pager is just you know four zero four number the nine one one like one after another after another. I'm thinking fuck somebody's died or something. So. <laughs> I call the number and it's Janie. She flips me to Eric. He's like, "What the fuck do you guys think you're doing?" You? And you know, he's under the impression somebody has worked him into thinking that Vince has let us go to basically decimate the, comp the company, beat right. everybody else, right. and then we're going to go back. And then Vince is just going to defend us. Did, did you have a contract at this point? We had a, we had a, a, a deal, just like a deal memo. We didn't have hard contracts. Oh boy! So immediately. You know, they we have a they rush us into Jock and Jills, and they sign us to a longer deal, more lucrative deal. Of course, and of course we're acting completely dumb to it all because we are. Yeah. I'm like, you want to give me more money and have me stay here longer? Whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And then the, of course the next Monday, you know, Kane and uh, some other jack off from Canada come out as Razor and Diesel, and <laughs> you know it's like. Oh, it wasn't them. Mm, not, not the greatest moment. <laughs> Glenn Jacobs and Rick Bogner. When they, uh, is that who was Rick Bogner? Yeah, Rick Bogner. And they, they could not fill your shoes up there. But let's worry about them so much. So now we're in. DiBiase, DiBiase is in there. Man. Now, at, at some point, the NWO had grown uh, to seven or eight members. And it became, how do we use the NWO at this point? And someone had the idea, is Sting going to join? Is Paige going to join? Who were the top baby faces there? Tell us about right. that that line of thinking. Well, what it was basically this time was then. Then I, I remember Bischoff came out, and Bischoff said that he was giving contracts to anybody that would jump sides. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe Bagwell was the guy that jumped that yes. night. Yes. I think Bagwell jumped that night, and uh, I believe that Scotty turned on his brother at a pay per view. That's correct. And he, he showed, showed up the us. next night with his hair cut and right. blonde. Yeah. So Scotty, you know, Scotty joined us, and then it was, you know, we wanted Paige and we wanted Sting. Well, Sting kept, a, you know, Sting was in the rafters, so we went. So Scott and I in uh, in the Superdome, and we had been trying to do this forever, because at that point Dallas was hot, and we and it was yeah. one of those deals where Dallas's friendship with Eric was actually hindering him and not helping him. Well, the, wait, now wait a minute. You're telling me that it wasn't Paige's friendship with Eric that got him the push to the top? No. 
I, I, I hate I hate to, to all those people that, that think it was. I hate to. It was one of those deals that you know, and, and Paige, Paige had, had was such a positive guy. Like I was getting ready to quit the business, and he was like, "Don't quit the business." Mm -hmm. And when Scott needed a job, he brought Scott in as a diamond stud. So we right. both kind of, and in the business, it's one of those deals where there's markers, you know. And yeah. we both owed Paige a mark, and we watched him. He bang, he hit somebody with his finish in Chattanooga, and the whole place erupted. I looked at, I looked at Scott. Scott looked at me. And we said, "He's over," mm -hmm. but he's not. He's in the middle of the card because. You know, they, they won't give him that push because it's Eric's boy. So we'd laid out this thing, and the three of us sat down, and, you know, of course, Dallas liked it because he was going to be the first, because nobody got in hold of us yet. Right. So we ended up doing it, and we you know, offered him a shirt in the, uh, in the Superdome, and Dallas looked at it, and I went to the corner like he had accepted it. In the meantime, he banged uh, Scott. I turned around saw Scott down. I charged him, went over, went, went, went tried to go through a table, but... See, I'm not that mm. kind of wrestle, so I, I flipped it as I went over it. <laughs> now, the, the story that we get, and I talked to Paige earlier, nine times, on the sheet, off the sheet, oh, on yeah. the sheet, off the sheet. And then even that night, it was like scheduled for 12 minutes, and by the time we got to the curtain, Dallas walks over with this and just crazed face. He goes, they've cut it to four. I looked at him, I said, fuck, dude, it's going to take me four minutes to walk to the ring. <laughs> I said, we're not last. It's live TV. We got to we got. I said, I'm not worried about it. At that point, Diamond Dallas Page, the first one to shun the offer, right. to show you up. Right. And that only helped the angle. Right, because then, you know, w what really helped the angle at the beginning of it was that even though we attacked, when we first attacked, like the Dungeon of Doom still was attacking the horsemen. And, yeah. I mean, the inner feud still went. They didn't, they didn't, and then finally, when we got a big enough army, that, that whole WCW alliance kind of, then it was right. kind of you know, north-south, it was kind of like a Civil War type thing. Right. And then the battle lines were drawn, then you know, guys started jumping. So, but then what happened was everybody that was anybody was, was an, anointed, you know. Mm -hmm. Hey, my brother, you know, he's tool and die guy in Cleveland. I thought maybe we could give him an NWO shirt next week. You know, we're going to be in Cleveland. Yeah, fuck, why not? So I kind so, of... So we're in, we're in the black and white. Was in vogue. That, you had to do that. Yeah, you had to Not just it. the fans, but the guys backstage. Yeah, well, I remember, man, but I remember going to arenas and looking out and going, oh my God, it's, this is amazing. At some point, Sting was in, was in that mix. When, when, and that's, we, we talked to Paige earlier about, and he's talking about Jeff Farmer. Jeff Farmer came in as a, as a fake sting. That, that was an interesting part because in, in many ways that furthered the angle, maybe further than it would have gone otherwise because it led to Hogan's sting. Right, well what it did was, I remember that, that we did something where we, I think we attacked Lex or somebody, we used the bogus sting and then Lex was, right. was sure that it was sting that attacked him, but it, you know, it was our bogus sting and then I think Sting cut the promo in Asheville, North Carolina, where he said, you know, that he's, not, he's been nothing but a flagship for this company. Basically, he turned his back, and then he, that's when he, you know, turned into the crow and went to the rafters. Exactly. And that was, I mean, because that was, you know, that was, he became, you know, the, 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 the epitome of the anti-hero, which was the hot thing at that time, and he became that. He became the anti-hero. He didn't speak. He, uh, he didn't was like, wrestle. No, but he hit and ran. You know, he, he, would, he would come down, he would, I remember one time he saved Paige and took him up to the rafters with him, and we were right. about to beat him down. I mean, there were things that, you know, and, and, and I dropped out of the ceiling in, at Auburn Hills one night, and that Sting outfit dropped about 360 feet. I, I, one of them's still about right here. I still haven't <laughs> got one of them down. I said, man. Now, it's, as, as the angle is, is playing out, Kevin, um, the NWO grew so large bigger than some territories, right. you split off, formed right. the Wolf Pack. Right. Tell us about the decision-making process there. Originally, the Wolf Pack was always going to be Sean, Michael, or Sean Waltman, Scott, and myself. Because right. we called ourselves the Wolf Packs when we were in the NWO. Right. And then it became a situation where they, there, there was actually so much heat, real-life heat, between Terry and I that you know, they just were going to put us opposite each other it's like, you know... The, uh, really? I never heard that story. What, what brought that I up? mean, it was just heat. I, it, it, Terry probably says it the best. And, you know, Terry and I worked through all of our, you know... I mean, Scott and I were, were dicks. I mean, that's just... I mean, we were just dicks. And like Hogan said, he goes, you know, my whole life, he goes, here I am, you know, the fucking man, 
and I'm this big giant apple tree that has all these golden apples and everybody else in the fucking world is happy to stand underneath it, get shade, and wait for a golden apple to fall their way. He said, in comes Nash and Hall with a fucking chainsaw on first day. They decide, fuck that, we're going to cut the tree down and take all the apples. Mm -hmm. You know, and he just, he couldn't believe that anybody had that little respect for what he'd done. And it wasn't that. I don't think so. It was, a, the, the thing was, to Scott and I, is there was an invisible ceiling of $750,000. Nobody made more than seven hundred fifty grand a year except for Hogan. Right. And I told Scott, I said, if we push, I said, once we get through that envelope, I said, it's going to open the door for everyone. I said, we'll all make more money. I said, because they think that that's, and I said, that's not, that's, that's some envelope they've come up with. I said, we've got, we've got to push. I said, the only way to do it is to push. We've got to push him. We've got to push him to say, fuck, give them some more money and get them off my back. Which eventually they worked. They worked. <laughs> you, did. you got it. You got, you got you the know? check. So, but, you know. Wolfpack. So Wolfpack was, uh, we had, we, we split and, uh, the original members were me and Conan and Randy and Lex. Lex joined us. We had Lex to join us was a third member. And then we were in Providence. I will never forget this. We, were, we, we, we had been courting uh, Sting for, for quite some time. And in Providence, Rhode Island, Sting accepted, you know, he accepted the Wolfpack shirt. And I remember thinking to myself, I've, you know, I've heard about Road Warrior Pops in St. Paul. Yeah. But I think this surpassed it. It was huge. I remember it was, it was one of those nights where you just say, man, I said, this is, and I walked out of the building that night. I said, man, I said, this is, this is going to really, this is going to go. This, we're going to have the civil war between the two factions. Never happened. Nope. And why not? Because that's what everyone was expecting. That's what you were building to. Well, what ended up happening was, I mean, a phenomenon named Goldberg. Absolutely. You know, so Good. Bill, Bill came along and, and it kind of shifted everybody's gears because what happened was, Austin became so incredibly red hot. They were doing the Austin McMahon angle. It was almost like, you know, we had to have something that was comparable to the Austin. Mm -hmm. Just so happened we had a guy that, that, that had kind of the same look, you know, much, a much bigger, I mean, completely different character, but, you know. And, but the thing was that that machine, that it needed to be fed. You know, Goldberg was one of those things that so so everything psychology-wise switched because basically now you had something that was more of a Hogan where you had to make a heel factory mm -hmm. to just attack this one single entity. Right. You know, so they, I think at that point we shifted gears because his popularity, by the time he was 50 and oh, shit, he was over, over. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, so and and overshadowing a little bit the NWO factions? Uh, we thought so. We thought that he was the most over guy in the company. And yeah. never, never any talk of having him join one faction or the no. other. No, because he he would, because he didn't speak. Both factions were kind of wise asses. They had their wise. I mean, I mean that was the whole thing. Was we had more talkers than workers in those groups. <laughs> you know, that's that's easily said. I mean, it, there are exceptions. Anybody that I'm I'm saying that couldn't work, and other, you know, there were some good workers. But a lot, a lot of the guys had, you know, the working boots had seen their better days. Now, somewhere through this, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you were given, if not the book, but given the power to, to develop I was storyline. I was given a degree of power. Right. A tell us, tell us about that. Um, it was, we were going into, um, into the, the start of the new year, and Goldberg had became the Yankees. Goldberg was so successful mm -hmm. that they start, were starting to chant, Goldberg sucks because nobody had beat him. So now, now the situation became, somebody has to beat him. So I was a baby face, you know? And I said, you know, and they said, blah, 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 blah. He'd already worked with Hogan and beaten Hogan. They said, right. we need a Starcade match. So I said, shit, I'll beat him. I mean, and I said, but this is what we'll do. And I laid out the angle. Now, in Bill's book and in a lot of the storylines, they'll put that Kevin Nash took over the book and beat Bill Goldberg. I didn't start booking until February the 16th or 14th. We beat Bill on December 27th. Right, right. So I wasn't, I wasn't the booker. I've always had stroke. I've had stroke since 93. But you have to realize, too, that at 6'10", 300 pounds, you walk in a room anywhere, you got stroke. I don't yeah. give a fuck if you're the worst guy in the business. Ain't nobody going to say shit to your face. Yeah. 
So I mean, stroke is stroke. So it, wh whose call was it to be Goldberg at Starcade? It was it was it was Eric's. I mean, Eric was the one that inevitably said we need to beat him because they were chanting Goldberg sucked. We laid out the thing where we do the thing with Hogan with the Miss Elizabeth sex thing and everything else, and basically what we do is we 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 we. Dog pile him in the Georgia Dome. The, the Falcons would make the save to get us off him. Then he would have nine guys to work with. Mm -hmm. We'd go to Wooster Mass. And uh, no, it wasn't Wooster Mass. It was that damn little town, like Salisbury Mass, is where it was. Went to Salisbury Mass, which is a town that WCW had never ran. At this point now, the NWO faction is Bret Hart. Jeff Jarrett, Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall, three WWF guys right. in, a, in a WWF building, and they start chanting, Goldberg sucks, and they told Scott, whatever you do, don't do a survey, and Scott went out and said, how many people want to see NWO? <laughs> <laughs> they always said, how many people want to see Goldberg? <laughs> and they booed him, and he, they started chanting, Goldberg sucks, and he was so livid, and then he said, you know, he said, whatever you do, he said, I got this, I got like a cyst underneath this breast. He said, I've got to get it cut out. He said, whatever you do, don't hit me with that bat. I mean, Scott must have hit him five times right mm, in the fucking tit oh with that boy. bat. And he wanted to kill Scott. So, but he's got to chase Brett into this limo and he gets out there and he's supposed to, he's got this steel thing on his hand where he's supposed to, mm -hmm. you know. And I told him in the back, I said, I said, Brett's running, he's going to drop a bat. Just pick up the bat, Bill. He goes, no, let's just do it this way. He loses that thing, ends up putting his hand through the limo yeah. door, almost losing his arm, and in right. and, and essence, stopping the angle because the heel factory that we've built to feed him can, can't feed him because he's gone for a year. Yeah. So it shift gears again, but of course, that, that was my fault. Because, well, why so? Well, because, I mean, he put his hand through the window. Fuck, I was, you know... I was putting ideas out, you know, so I mean, that had to be my fault too, right? Now, now we left out one, one link in this chain, and that's the one finger pin right. with you and Hogan. Right. To, uh, the night after Starcade. Right. I was a baby face. I mean, I, I thought, I mean, it was one of those deals, you know, people will say, you know, I was so pissed off that night. I was so pissed off. It's just like, you were supposed to be a jackass. <laughs> that's, that's what he did. You were supposed to hate me. And I was going to say that I've already beaten Goldberg. There was no reason for me to. So he was going to have to go all the way through everybody to finally get a shot at me. And after he beat me, then he'd get a shot at Hogan. And then he would win. We'd screw him again, and he'd chase the belt again. The same old thing that's worked 100 years in this business. So you thought Goldberg would be in a stronger position Absolutely. chasing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because he, and, it, and, and I know for a fact that it worked because the night I beat him in Starcade. The crowd went, whoa, and then they went, oh, fuck, I don't know if we want him to get beat or not. If you ever watch the match, you can, you can feel it, and then it's kind of, the, there's a murmur, and then it's like, oh, we didn't mm -hmm. want him to get beat. We right. really like this guy. Right. So it already was there. The sympathy was already built into the angle. So, I mean, it would have worked, and if he would have had to, you know, it was like Tron, if he would have had to go through all these levels to finally get to Hogan... I mean, you had a year of, of easy, because all you got to do is storyline the beginning, you know, storyline your main shit, and then you just, all you got to do is filler for two hours after that. A year of the chase. Right. Obviously, he would get the belt back at Absolutely. some point. Absolutely. But the injury, and he's gone. You know, so once once he got injured, then you've got to shift gears, and, you know, and, and, and we had a rash of injuries that year. Yeah, we you know, we had four, four or five guys go down, so I mean, every time you're doing it, you're shifting gears, and... You know, Terry's, Terry's deal was so front-end loaded for incentives and working and everything else that at that point for him to take over as a commissioner, as an evil commissioner, would have been storyline-wise, would have been great, but monetary-wise it didn't work for Terry because Terry's deal was so loaded with incentives for pay-per-views and, right. and so on and so forth. So, I mean, they had basically painted Terry into such a corner where all he could do is work. And, you know, there was a lot of things that went on there, and it's just... You know, I'm not saying that I'm not without guilt. I mean, I was definitely at the grassy knoll with one of the rifles. I just wasn't the lone fucking gunman. That's all I'm saying. Oh, I'm sure the statute's run on that one. Now, well, which takes us to the, the, the fateful April 10th, 2000, Denver, Colorado, when Vince Russo and Eric Bischoff together reinvented Nitro. Right. 
And from there, after a pretty hot start with the New Blood and the Millionaires Club and whatnot, things really started to go south. And you, you were there for that, too. Tell us what it was like. You were there at, at the beginning of when we started to get hot. You rode the crest, and then you were there when we started to, to hit that downhill slide. Yeah, what happened, number one, they, you, they took Eric out and they put some accountant in, whatever the hell that guy's Bill name. Bush. Bill Bush. Yeah. Nice guy. Yes. You know, but, I mean, you know, he had the charisma of a, of a plastic plant. Not in danger of being an on-air talent. No, no. But, okay. uh, again, Kev, when things started to go south, what what was it like? I mean, you it's it's easy to enjoy life backstage when when we're hot. But when well, it was like it, it was it was like being in the business in in, in in 1989 and 90 when you went to the Philadelphia Civic Center and it was like doing stand up at a cruise ship. It was like fucking brutal. I mean, mm -hmm. there was nothing but smart people in the crowd, and you could feel that it was it was over. I mean, the run was over, but you know, every good thing comes to an end. You know? What would you have done differently? I mean, you weren't you weren't in a position of power at that point. If here here's the magic power, what would you have done differently than what happened there? Put the belt on me. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's your answer for everything. Fuck yeah, man. <laughs> um, put the strap on me and give me a scout a raise. <laughs> um, was there anything that could have been done? You know what? It was, it, and I hate to make my second reference to, the, to President Kennedy's assassination, but you know, at that point, it's just like. You know, you're going to go around and do a blood drive for the guy with his head, top of his head blown off, or you're just going to fucking make him comfortable and let him fucking, you know. It was, it was inevitable. We were yeah, it down. was. What, what, to me, when, when, when you lose the backing from the company. Yes. When I sat there and talked to Brad Siegel, and they had some, you know, uh, some feel-good movie that they had spent $45 million to make. And, you know, they all felt good about it so they could jerk each other off the Cable Ace Awards that year. And I sat there at a table with him in Denver, and I said, I said, you guys spent 40 or $45 million for a show that you'll play how many times a quarter? And he said, probably three times a quarter. I said, and you'll be happy if it does what? He said, we'll be happy if it does it too. I said, so inevitably, you're, you're going to get, if you're playing it three or four times a quarter, I said, you know, you're going you're to play this thing 16 times a year, and you're going to be happy if you get a two, we were still doing three threes, three fives to yeah. fours then yeah. for three hours of original programming for less than the cost of that. So are you in the business of actually doing programming? Then you say to yourself, oh, wait, this is TBS. This is the same channel that runs Dirty Dancing for fucking 24 hours like you're going to watch <laughs> it 16 times. You know, I mean, this is this, you're talking to these people. Then they go, "Gee, I wonder why Time Warner stock went from 112 bucks to six. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gee, I don't know, maybe because you had a bunch of idiots running the company. You won't get an argument from me there. I mean, so you know, it's one of those deals where you know people say, "What happened to WCW? Fuck, what happened to WCW? What happened to AOL Time Warner?" Amen. I mean, the, the the company fucking imploded. Why wouldn't a subsidi Why would one subsidiary uh, be able to survive that? 2001, last three months of the company, January, February, and March. You didn't come back for the for the last show. No. Were you asked? I was asked, but I I think the only girl that I hadn't slept with at that point was Stacy Keebler. I knew she'd be there. No. Um, Once again. <laughs> I'm kidding. That was a joke. <laughs> but but things came to. <laughs> It all came to a head there on March 27th in Panama City Beach. Uh, Goldberg wasn't there. You weren't there. It was anticlimactic. Well, I couldn't actually be there contractually because I still had 11 and a half months on my Turner deal. Right. Okay. <laughs> there you go. So I wasn't going to work for the opposition, nor was I going to give back any money. So I figured by not going there, they would know exactly where I stood because a lot of guys took buyouts. You stayed home. Yeah, I, I did. I, you know what? I, that was the year that I said to myself, I remember my wife coming over. We, my wife and I worked through all of our, our, a lot of our marital problems, and we, we were separated for a while and, and became unseparated, decided we would make, try to make it, make it work. And she came over. I was staying in the loft down in Buckhead, and she came in. I was just kicked back, drinking a beer at about 11 o'clock in the morning. She said, what are you doing? I said, I've reached my goal in life. She said, what's that? I said, I'm fucking getting paid to watch television. Nice. I said, and I'm going to for the next 11 and a half months.
So it's a good time. At some point here. Best year I ever had. Sounds good to Work me. Work rate was incredible. <laughs> no duds. Never looked better. Oh, f never looked better. Vince had the idea to bring in you and Scott and Hulk as the NWO right. into the WWE. Right. How was that initial conversation? Well, they said, you know, that they, they, they you know, had pulled the locker room and that uh, the poll was 99.9% uh, .9 of them wanted to fucking put us t to death. And <laughs> Hunter, Hunter and Shawn Michaels wanted us to come back. <laughs> and you came back. And Jack Lanza. Jack. Yeah, Jack Lanza. So there was, there was three guys that actually that wanted us to come back. So, uh, you know, so we came back and, I mean, you know, popped it. I mean, that place popped. Sure did. I mean, it popped, and I know exactly what happened. It popped. We were the NWO. A bunch of guys walked in there, and, and we were supposed to go over a lot of guys at WrestleMania. The, the day of WrestleMania, all of a sudden, the chain, all, the, all the finishes are changed. All the NWO guys are losing. Hulk's being split off away from us. And what basically happened, I thought, is it was, I can't prove this. It's a complete conspiracy theory, but I think a bunch of guys walked in and said, let me get this right. These motherfuckers almost put us out of business. And you're going to let these guys go over us who, who've sat here and battled these fuckers, not even looking at the fact that you now own that logo and it is a work and, yeah, and, is a work. and business is down because you just let Rock and Austin on the same day lose to Jericho. Yep. I mean, that, I don't think that was a smart move. It certainly hasn't panned out that way. No, I mean, I just think that that was, for that company, that was and nothing against Chris. Yeah. You know, it's just that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. Doing what's right and doing what right, what's right for business. Right. And, and they didn't do what was right. So next thing you know, Hogan's on SmackDown. They, you know, they, they told Scott, when Scott came in, his contract was for 10 days a month. He worked 23 days the first month, and God forbid he went off the wagon. You know, well, fuck, he wasn't supposed to. The, the contract was set up, well, this is only going to be for this because it's going to WrestleMania. Anybody that's worked there knows that the next week it's going to be... Oh, thank you, Kev. Cut me, Mick. <laughs> that, uh... <laughs> anybody that worked there knows that every fucking month it's something else. Well, yeah. we, I mean, this is, we're just, we're just, you know, we're gearing up for the THQ game. What the fuck? I mean, I mean every, you know... <laughs> yeah, well, you're going to work 30 days this month because, fuck, you know, I just bought a new Escalade. All right, Vince, <laughs> whatever it takes. I mean... Kevin, those salad days in WCW when... Look, you're rolling in the money, you've, you know, you've, you've played your hand and it's paid off, you won the pot, you got the, you got the gold, the story's from the road. You got to give me some. I know there are one or two. Let me think. I think the best one. I mean, just, one of, the, one of my favorite ones was uh, we did a deal in spring break that uh, oh, yeah. we did from Club La Vila. And... Um, Scott and I were, were on like double secret probation for drinking in the back of the buildings. And uh, at that point, Bischoff, you know, he, he said, you yeah, know, no more drinking. But it was, you know, it was spring break. So they flew us in. I think we flew into Pensacola. That was the only place that had first class uh, flights. We picked up a, uh, a convertible and, and took off. And we, we, you know, probably drove about five minutes. And Scott said, maybe we should get some beer. And I said, yeah, but let's just get a six pack. And, we agreed that maybe it'd be 16 ounces. And so we got 16 ounces. We said, yeah, but like a piece, right? Sure. Like six, six a piece, 16 ounces. By the time the traffic, we took 92, which is, I think it was 92, is that beach road that goes along the, the 98. Pan, 98, 98 through yeah, the, yeah. the panhandle there, Florida. And uh, I mean, we showed up at about 6.45. And it was one of those deals, like, we'd stopped and bought matching Hawaiian shirts, flip-flops. I mean, and we were hammered. And, and Bischoff's like, like, we can see him come and beeline. And we've got those big cases of Bud Light that actually are 24s. We each have two of them. And we figure if we can get into Hogan's trailer and get a beer in his hand, he won't holler at Hogan. And we'll just, we'll, you know, we'll get immunity. So we go in there, and he's, he runs in, and we lock the door. He's banging on it. We get Hogan and Savage to drink with us real quick. He opened the door, and now it's just like, we're going to fire Terry. <laughs> <laughs> and? He didn't. <laughs> so we went over, and I had to go do the news. I was supposed to do, like, the, the 6.30 weather or something like that, and I, like, I cursed, like, five times during it. Now, so wait a minute. 
on some like local a local like Pensacola news and like Scott's like you know making you know sexual innuendos to the weather lady and you know he keeps going are we on <laughs> <laughs> so then instead of laying the match up me and him go like in the club itself and drink until the show starts now we've got to walk through the people to get back to where the dressing so we'd go back there and Bishop was furious so we did this deal where the giant was going to come down and he was going to, you know, come and get us both. And we cut a promo. I said something about everybody needs to love the fat broads. And Scott, you know, we were waiting, waiting, waiting. And finally, Scott takes the microphone for me. He goes, hey, giant, that's your cue, you big dummy. So like, <laughs> cut the giant's music on. Here comes Paul. And he comes down. And, uh, you know, he comes to grab me. And I said, before he grabs me, I said, let me tell you something right now. I didn't know if you know this or not. I said, but I was in 1995, you know. Uh, jackknife champion, and I jumped. From, I was on the top rope. I jumped in the pool. The pool's about four feet deep. Yikes! I mean, I hit the bottom of that pool like a bullet. I didn't sell it. Scott did. This, Scott got thrown or choke slammed into things. Same thing. He hit the cement. We were so hammered, it didn't matter. So we get back, and, and Bischoff's waiting for us. There's this huge scaffolding with a bunch of girls on top of it. They're watching the show, and he says to me, "He goes, you're drunk." And you're going to be both be suspended for one month without pay. I said, Eric, I'm not drunk. And somebody yells up to me, Hey, Nash, Nash. I said, she said, What are you drinking? She said, I think she had like a tequila sunrise or something. And she had it in like a solo cup. She's about 65, 70 feet above me. And I said, Drop it. Bishop's standing right here. She drops it. And I go, Phew, and catch it without spilling a thing. I take a <laughs> sip. And I said, I look at him. I said, Doesn't look to me like I'm drunk. I walk away, and Bagwell goes, I was like James Bond. I said, I'm so hammered. <laughs> but, I mean, and, and that was, and they actually made Scott, they made Scott go to rehab. It, was, he, it made him, forced him to go to rehab that next wow. day. So we go to the bar that night, and Scott tells the... Um, now, wait a minute, not the night of his first day in rehab. No, this is okay. the night that, like, that we have this big powwow, and either, either Scott's going to get fired or he's going to go forced to rehab by, by the company. Right. So Scott says, well, I'm not going to give up two, two mil, I'll, I'll do the 30 days. So Scott goes to the bar and Eric says, no more drinking. So Scott goes to the bar and Sting's across from him at the bar. And he's, he's you know, talking shit to him, going, hey, you know, hey Sting, how am I doing it? He's already t he's smart enough, the bartender, to give him Diet Cokes. So Scott's shooting his Diet Cokes and Sting's shooting Jack. Yee. Sting doesn't drink. No. Mm. And he's like eight, eight each, you know. Finally, Bischoff walks over. He goes, "What are you doing?" He goes, "It's Diet Coke." And you can just see Sting from across going, like, "Oh!" <laughs> <laughs> like even on their way to the tank, these guys are getting us. Oh boy. That one and and the only thing I can say about Scott Hall is there's an old saying that goes that uh, a friend will help you move, a good friend will help you move a body. <laughs> Scott was a good friend. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not sure. Like, we we talked about statutes and uh, right, limitations, right. And so let's not let's not get into that. Now, that was the crest for WCW. You were on top in the WW then WWF stories from the road. Pam Anderson stories, maybe. No, I, I, I Pam. I saw her on Baywatch once. She looked like she was an attractive young lady. Um, right, honey. I don't know anything about her. Um, no, she was, she was, she was, you know, she did some stuff with us, but, uh, I don't think anybody was on that. I would have known <laughs> buses and it was just, I mean, you knew going over there that it was going to be, you know, no sleep, run like hell. Everybody, the crowds were so live. Mm -hmm. So you worked your ass off every night, but I mean, it was just like the party. I mean, it was from the minute you got on the bus that morning to the, I mean, it was an all day until you just couldn't go anymore. It was just, you know. And I remember we were about 10 days in, and Dan Spivey had came back and was kind of doing like that Cape Fear gimmick. Yeah, the Waylon Mercy. Yeah, and he had the, like a dagger on his head. And we had, we'd been playing, we had Yoko on our bus. And at the beginning, it was like they had the heels and the baby faces on buses, but then it became one of those situations like, let me get this right. We're away from our families for a month. You're going to tell us who the fuck we're going to sit with on a bus because it's baby faces and heels? And you've got a care of it. And I remember Bam Bam standing up meeting goes, Nash and those guys are breaking kayfabe. They're sitting on the heel bus. I see. He said, you know, there's people that could go from town to town. And Scott stood up and goes, they go to town to town. You think if they've watched the, the same match 17 nights in a row, they might think it's fake?
<laughs> like maybe, <laughs> you know. But uh, I, I remember just Yoko would, would play that gangster rap. Just and I remember, really? Oh yeah, Yokozuna. He'd play, yeah, he played gangster rap the whole time we were on the bus. And we stopped at some place, and there was McDonald's, and, and, and I looked over at Spivey, and you could just see he was just visibly cracked. His skin was gray. He had still had the dagger tattoo on from the night before, and he was just mm. sitting there. I walked by, I said, hey, what's up, dagger head? And he just looked at me like, that was it. He came home, and it was done. Really? There were so many guys that vanished in that territory. What? What happened with Dan Spivey? I mean, that, I, he was just gone. He just said, he said, uncle. Mm. Shane Douglas did that. The I mean, you know, Shane was a big star at ECW. Shane was a good performer, but he went into that Shark Tank, and I think Shane, because he was educated, you know, said, you know what? No. What What is it about the WWF back then that that could eat alive talented performers like like Shane and uh, and Spivey? I think it's the fact that we, I mean, we always just used to refer to it as a shark tank. Yeah. You know, it was one of those deals where, I mean, it was, it was a work, but it wasn't a work that, if you were one of the top two or three guys, you knew that you were going to make more money than an opening match. I mean, right. you were paid accordingly where you were on the card. So, I mean, it was, I mean, it was cutthroat. And that's why we basically, when we formed the click, it was like, we knew there'd be power in numbers and it'd be a deal like, you know, nobody back, you know, nobody backstabs anybody else. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we'd have, you know, collectively we'd have four matches on the card in our car. Right. You know, right. so we'd have, you know, Kid usually open because he'd have a great match. And then Hunter was on his way up, but he was undefeated at the time. He'd be mid. And then, you know, Sean, uh, Scott was working for the IC belt. And then Sean and I were wrestling each other. We'd all travel. We'd work that night. We'd, we'd work the garden, get out of the, get out of the garden get in the back of an ambulance, go to the Days Inn, get in our car, and the guys that just worked the match, there'd be a hundred fans there, we'd just get in our car, they knew, I mean, it was just, yeah. I remember they, they pulled us aside, Vince pulled us aside, and Scott Hall said, man, he said, if I'm going to be on the road this long, said, I'm going to travel with who I want to travel with, I just, I, even, even as late as that, 95, 96, he's still, Vince McMahon's yeah. still worried about kayfabe. They were, they were still worried about kayfabe, after they'd come out and publicly said it was entertainment, that, you know, so they wouldn't have to pay the, uh, right. the commissions in New Jersey and New York. You're a big, tough guy. Seven foot, 300 pounds at your head. No, actually, I'm actually, I'm, I'm a, I was a uh, uh, small arms expert in the Army, so I'm a much better shot than I am tough guy. Seriously? Yeah. You can't use a gun in the ring, not yet, but when you're in the ring, Anybody ever try to take liberties and, and show up the big guy? You ever get any potatoes in there that you had to give receipts for later on? Yeah, I mean, yeah, coming I mean, up. Never, obviously. never. Vader was real stiff with me early. Hash, Hash, what's his name? Hashimoto, or whatever his name oh, is. Oh sure, yeah. The El fat Elvis. He was. Uh, I didn't say that. I did. Pork and chicken. He um, he was real stiff, but I mean, most of those guys you potato them back, and they just, you know, they they'd lighten up. You, you never had that problem of somebody trying to make well, a name. Like, like Pierre, Pierre wouldn't put me over. You remember Pierre? Sure, Pierre will let. Yeah, he wouldn't put me over. We were in Montreal, and before the match, they uh, not, we were the main event. And back then, they'd always book like guys from Quebec and Montreal in the main right. events because they thought it drew. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so we had a good house, so I guess he must have drawn a hell of a house that night. Um, so he comes in the back, he says, I, I listened to the people before the match, I think maybe 60-40 me. And I'm like, 60-40 you? You're kicking mid-card guy. I'm like, all right, 60-40 you. So they lay the match out, so like the agents like are going to are gonna let this go. So I figure they're going to let this go. But So the boys are like, so he won't do a job. Mm. He won't take my finish. You yeah. know, I'm the champ. And back then it was just like, we, it, we policed it so t you, you couldn't use somebody's finish as a high spot without walking through the curtain and having 10 guys jump down your throat. Yeah. So, you know, he decides that he's not going to, he's not going to, he says, uh, maybe we do a double count out. So, when, you know, this, I'm a champ. Yeah, I've beaten everybody with my finish. I'm like, so I don't get any backing from the agents that night. They don't, they don't back me. They can't get a hold of Vince. I can't get a hold of Pat. So we do it, and I got him. He's got me in a rear chin hole. They're chanting "Diesel, Diesel," and I don't hear anybody not with me. And I might look up at him. I said, uh, "Maybe a uh, ninety-nine uh, one me." I said, "Do you want to change your finish?" He says, "No." So 
I'm not get anything of it, but that night, of course, you get in the car, and Scott and Sean get in the car with me. You're like, that's bullshit, man. That guy, he's killing the business. He, 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 he's supposed to lay down for you. That's part of it. So the next day, we go to Quebec City, and they've worked me into a frenzy. So that night, he says, uh, you know, and he's got heat from the office, but he says, you know, he says, maybe uh, tonight, big boot for the finish. Uh, you, you know, you cover me. I said, that ain't my, that ain't my finish. I said, my finish is, is the power bomb. He says, I'm maybe big boot. So we get on the ring and he slams me and says he's going to go off the top. And when he does, he drops a leg, but he basically drops his ass on my head. Yow. Before he could get to his feet, I was on my feet. I field goal kicked him in the balls, mm. threw him in the corner, punched him twice in the face, and grabbed him by his throat. And I said, it's big boot power bomb or I'm going to kill you. He looked at me and he just shook his head, yes, I sent him off, I kicked him as hard as I possibly could in the face, picked, picked up his limp body and power bombed as hard as I could, went by the Canadian promoters and flipped them off while all the American guys stood behind the curtain going, yeah, suck on that, Canada, suck on that. <laughs> and it was like one of those deals where they, so he, then he came back in the locker room, man, and, and, I, and I was... Yeah, I'm, I was hot, hot, and he came in the back, and you know, and, and the agents were, had him by his arm, you know, mm -hmm. like this. And he came back. He said, "You want to go? I will go." And I just looked at him. I said, "Dude, I said, if I go again, I said I'm going to kill you. I said I'm not going to stop till it's over." And he just stood there, and then I later on, uh, Renee, uh, one of the one of the agents, said, "He says, let me tell you, Big D, I had him barely like this. If he wanted to go, he could have went." I said, "I could see it in his eyes. He's a punk." I said, "I wasn't worried about." It. We worked things out later on. It was, he was young, and it was, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a bad, bad decision. But I mean, of all the matches I've had, that's the only time that anybody is. And I got bad knees. If you wanted, to, you could leg dive me. But I think that anybody knew that if you leg dived me and took me down, I mean, you'd have to fight four guys. I mean, you, you might, we used to always have a thing, me and Scott and Sean, everybody's just like, you know, hey, I got problems with so-and-so. You know, if I'm on top, don't do anything. But if he gets on top, don't be afraid to kick him in the face. So I think everybody knew that. We had a pack of five guys that pretty much was always together. So if you were going to fight one of us, you are going to fight five of us. Didn't have any problems. No. They, everyone knew. Plus, we, we, plus, I mean, we're Vince's boys. I mean, we're working hard. We weren't complaining. You know, Vince money. Yeah, Vince was happy with us. So I mean, as long as you're, the boss is happy, then you know the underneath. I remember Ted DiBiase walking into Vince's office saying, "If the click doesn't leave, you know, I'm leaving." And he said, "All right, see ya." Mm. Regrets, Kevin, a, a career that's regrets. Now... I've had a few, <laughs> but then again, no, not not too few to mention. We want to mention a few. That's why we're doing regrets. this. Um, now think. I mean, think back. The people that are watching this are going to know the Master Blaster start off the Oz thing. Yeah, the well, Vegas actually, thing. the Master. I should have never cut my hair because I had great. I worked at a strip club, and I had this great long. But Why doesn't that which, surprise which, you? Which, which that's yeah. I saw some today. Some some guy showed me some magazines. I, I broke in for some cannery. <laughs> there were some cans in there, but I mean there was. A cannery in Georgia. They came and got me from the Cheetah Three in Atlanta. I was a bouncer at the hottest strip. We had like five penthouse girls working there at one time. Know it well. Yes, who doesn't? If you've made it through there on the convention who, scene. Who pulled you out of there? Uh, actually, the Steiners did. I, I worked out of Coffee's Gym with uh, actually Robbie, Rick Steiner. Uh, he um, said you ought to try to get into wrestling. He said back then I was about 350. I mean I was yeah. on a little of the supplementation. I would think. Had you been a fan growing up? On and off, uh, mostly. When I was a kid, we had big-time wrestling out of Detroit that had, like, The Sheik and Dick the Bruiser. We had Bobo Brazil. I mean, the Kangaroos, Moose Chodlock, Igor, Furpo. I mean, that was, you know, yeah. kind of our crew of guys. I mean, I watched it, and I remember in 6th, 7th grade when they would have wrestling around, we'd gouge each other's eyes, and, you know. <laughs> I mean, we'd do, they'd say, okay, we're going to do wrestling class, and we did, you know, wrestling. That's so you, you, you knew a little when yeah. when uh, the Steiners pulled you out of the out of the cheetah. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, I watched it here and there, and then I, then when I became friends with those guys, they used to get me tickets, and I'd go down to the uh, the Omni and watch them. Yeah. When they were, and they, and they had some great tag teams. They had uh, Spivey and uh, and Vicious were the uh, the skyscrapers. The skyscrapers. Yeah. They had Doom. They had the Steiners. The Road Warriors were there then. So I mean, they had I mean, the tag. I, mean, I, I always like tag wrestling. Samoan SWAT team was there at that time. Yeah. So I mean, they had they had some they had some great uh, some great tag teams. How long between that first meeting, and they suggested it, dropped the hint, did you make the move? 
Um, I, it's one of those things like, like anybody that tries to break in, it's just like, you know, it's such a close fraternity because, you know, a seven foot guy walks up to you that's in shape, that's, that's a big old guy, that's an athlete. I mean, he says, I want to get into this. I mean, everybody does the same thing. It's just like, well, there's 250 jobs. He'll probably get one of them. Shit, it may be mine. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, guys look at it that way. So it's kind of hard to break in. But Robbie was a good friend, and I ended up going down to Jody's school down in uh, in, in uh, Lovejoy. But I, I switched from the cheetah from working day shift, so I go to wrestling school at night. I did that for about eight months, and they came down and looked at me. I think Oli looked at me, and then they started me on TV with uh, live TV. Was my first match, Class of Champions. With Al Green? With No, it was Corey Pendarvis. Corey Pendarvis? Who? Corey Pendarvis. He lasted five matches. That one I don't remember at all. Yeah, he's a guy that missed the headbutt by about four and a half feet. They said, uh, it take, yes. they said it takes you a lifetime sometimes in this business to hear the people. I knew we lost him the first night I was in the ring. Mm. Now that one, I do remember the missed headbutt. Yeah, but I, that it was, was Corey Pendarvis, who actually, if you're out there, thanks for taking my eyes out shirt and 300 bills before you left, oh, you boy. prick bastard. <laughs> Well, they put you with Al Green later. Then, yeah, well, Al Green. Well, we went. To, it was we were on the road for about four or five days, and Dutch Mantel and Sid Vicious just were brutal to this guy, telling me he was a shits and everything else. And we woke up in Chicago. We had a show in Hammond, and uh, he just we, we got up and his bags were gone, and he just left. So I got to Hammond, Indiana, and Grizz, uh, Jake's dad, Grizz was the uh, was the agent. He said, uh, "Hey, Green, you're going to be Nash's partner." So they put Al with me that night, and then we went to TV in Montgomery, and they kept him with me. And a, a much better hand, Al Green, yeah, than Al was, whoever this other guy. Yeah, Al was a much better hand. I mean, he, Al was still green, but thus the name. To, to coin a phrase. But, uh, Almost a road warrior clone. Roadies had been gone. Well, yeah, but, they, but that's the whole thing. The first night, they're saying L-O-D wannabe. They're chanting that. I mean, it's one of those things, you know, just like, I mean, you know, you're, you're basically, to me, it was like I took a pay cut. I was making 75 grand, I was making more than that and looking at how to ass all day. So, I mean, I'm thinking, I got a mohawk, I could be sitting there drinking Grand Marnier's looking at hot girls all day. I'm on the road, I'm eating at Waffle House three times a day, I'm not making any money, and I'm the shits. And I go out every night and expose myself how bad I am. I said, this probably is not going to work. And you thought, the answer must be Oz. No, I, Dusty sat me down and he says, I got an idea for it. It's Oz. And I said, I don't get it. He said, you're going to be Oz. I said, Oz is a geographical region. And he says, no. I said, no. I said, it's the wizard of Oz. I said, there's a wizard, but he's from Oz. It's like the United States. I said, it's a geographical region. I said, you can't be a geographical region. He says, no, you're going to be Oz. And I said, all right, this is a rib. Then when I got the uh, costume in St. Petersburg and there was that rubber mask, I went, oh. Mm -hmm. All right, this is a rib, and they're going to see if they can run me out of the business. Now, you're Kevin Nash. We've seen your personality. Right. And you're, you, you're a forceful guy. You speak your mind. Did it ever occur to you, like, you know, this may not be the best use of a seven-foot guy who's in shape who actually can at least show potential to do something. This is going to kill me. You know what, though, Kevin Sullivan that day, you know, I asked him, I said, Sully, what are you doing? And he looked at me and says, brother, take the money. I looked at him and I said, and I'd gotten a bump in, in pay, like about 50 grand. I said, you know, I ended up working seven times that year as Oz, I think. Wow. So Boy. at 156 grand, I was probably the highest paid guy in the business. Per, per match, yeah. Boy. Yeah. It's a hell of a run. That, uh, that debut in St. Petersburg at... at uh Oh boy, with with you and Kevin Sullivan and the monkey and I can't remember what all else came out. That, uh, that was... Uh, you know, the funny thing is they sent me to Japan because you know, they were going to pay me this money. So they sent me to Japan. It was a complete flop in the States. They sent me to Japan. So the first night we're in, we're in uh, Osaka in the Osaka Dome. Mm -hmm. And they've got this, they've, they've built something about the size of this table. And I'm lowered underneath this thing. And mm -hmm. there's this really cool techno music and these smoke and these lasers. And they raise me up to this top of this thing. And I stop and there's smoke and it clears. And there's... 17, 18,000 people, and they're chanting something. They're chanting, Aze, Aze. And I look and I said, oh, my God, this thing is over in Japan. Because I was a big guy with blonde hair. I mean, that's, you know, at that point, that's all right. you needed to be. Yeah. And I went over there, and the Steiners told me, beat everybody's ass. Just get over. And before the tour was over, Hattori came up to me and says, 
don't resign with WCW. He said, you come over here and work. So I knew I had some place to go. Good. You know, then I did the Vinny Vegas thing, and then from that, I caught Shawn Michaels' eye because he thought it was funny. Who, who brought you the Oz character? Who brought you Vinny Vegas? Um, Dusty brought me the Oz character. And, but see, he, he had to lay it out a whole different way, and then they didn't let him do it the way he wanted to do it. Right. It was supposed to be an attraction. It was supposed to, you know, that, but it didn't work. It, you know, I'm not blaming Dusty for it. Sure. Hell, I'm not. No. <laughs> um, but, uh, Vinny Vegas. Vinny Vegas was kind of my idea because I always liked that. I mean, I just kind of liked that kind of guy. You know? Yeah. So I just thought that was, it was kind of like an Andrew Dice, because Dice was hot back then. Sure. So. Honestly, from, from watching your career progress from, from the ground up, other than when you're yourself, that one seemed to be the most likely. And that was the first guy to ever do a crotch chop. Vinny did the one, he used to do the one hand crotch chop like that. And he had the snake eyes finisher, snake which I thought was a brutal finisher. looking finisher. For, given to me by Brian Pillman. Was given me, yeah, given, me, yeah, given me by Pillman. Pillman said, I got an idea because you'll work. He said, I used to try to do it down in Calgary, but it never works. I was too sure he said, it'll work. And I was working with him the night that he showed me how to do it. Good. Go, go through the finish. How, how did, what did he tell you, and how did you react he to just that? Said, he, he wanted me to actually pick the guy up and kind of do it like a gorilla slam and drop him on the top. But I was afraid I couldn't control it, but I was so tall I could just... It was almost like doing Davy Boy's finish, like just, you know, that, mm -hmm. that stampede slam. So I just got the guy up there, and then when I got close, I just sidestepped and pushed the guy up in the air. That way he could basically take it with his feet. It would look like it killed him, but, you know, right. the guy could work it all. It was, it was a real easy bump. Ever any injuries come out of that? No. I, Unfortunate I victims? I don't think that I've actually ever hurt anybody. I dropped a giant on his head, but I told, I told him in the back that, he was 560 and I couldn't get him. I said, I barely got you and you were 500. I said, I can't get you. I don't, and they, he said, no, you'll get me. I said, no, I won't. I said, I can't get around your stomach. You know, I couldn't hook him to, to get him. I said, I'm going to drop you. Now, that was one scary looking bump when he took that yeah. power bomb and, and, it, and he just, I don't know if he, I don't know if I put all the heat on you for that. I, it, it, as big as he is, I don't know if he tucked right or what. He dropped his hands. What happened was we hit that, we hit that, the, when you hit that point in no return and, the first thing you want to do is you're like, oh shit, I'm not going to make it, and you drop your hands because of you're disorientated where you are. And as soon as you, I mean, a, a guy that big, from instead of being tucked to drop those 150 pounds of arms he had, I mean, mm -hmm. just couldn't control it. I mean, the physics of it's, you know, the inertia, is, the inertia, is, I mean, just poof, he was going, and I could feel my back starting to tear. I mean, I could feel. I, I said either 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 he dies or I die. Self a son of a bitch. I dropped him on his beam. <laughs> <laughs> and damn near broke his neck. From the nah, he, he had, he, you know what, uh, he's so damn tough, that guy. guy. Yes, he I is. Mean, he's, you know, Paul's a tough son of a bitch. I mean, I, I, if he had dropped me on my head like that, he'd have killed me. But him, he, I mean, he had, a, he had a little bit of a headache and threw up in the back once. I mean, he had like a grade one concussion or something like that. I mean, it wasn't that even, was all. he didn't even go get an MRI. Oh my God. Jump forward here to the return of the NWO to the WWE a couple of, couple of years ago with you and Scott and Hulk. You, apart from being all of our hero for any number of reasons, but you got back into the WWE with good money and got injured, sat out, got yourself back in shape, or you, were all, you had gotten yourself in terrific shape doing a comeback. Got yourself healed up, rehab, came back in, first match in, almost the first step back in, hurt again and gone again. How does that make you feel? You know, it was a, that was unbelievable. I, I wasn't medically cleared for my bicep tear. Mm. So that day they came to us, and it was one of those one of those deals where, like, you know, it's complete panic booking that they decide that, you know, no comeback, no nothing, just you're going to wrestle right And I said, I don't have my gear. I said, I'm not medically cleared. I'm leaving a powerhouse gym in Philadelphia. And I tore my bicep in that building three months earlier. So I'm mm -hmm. back in the exact same building I tore my bicep in. Oh boy. So I have Disco Inferno who's not working for us. I called Glenn and I said, Glenn, I said, go to the concierge at my building and get my gear. Well, he can't find everything, so he sends me most of my stuff, but he doesn't send me my, he, he can't find my right, my left knee brace. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, you know, so I stretch, but I, I mean, I stretch so much during the day. 
and we, it was like an eight-man tag, mm -hmm. and guys like Benoit wrestled somebody earlier in the show, and something else happened. So, you know, we're trying to put this eight-man together, and it was one of those clusters. Like, okay, it's like okay, main event up in, in eight minutes. We've got nothing, including a finish. Mm. So it's one of those deals. Like, and, and, and I'm not saying anything against new talent. Most of these guys can't work without a net. They can't call it on the fly. They have right. to have it choreographed. They have to. And I don't work that way. When I came back, a guy would say to me, we're going to do this, 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 this. And I'm like, Phew. dude, I don't even remember what I had for breakfast. What's the finish? <laughs> you know, give me one or two high spots. Give me something you call. I said, but I can't, I just can't, I don't have that kind of memory. I just, yeah. I didn't learn to do it that way. Right, right. Because I'll tell you one thing right now, as drunk as we used to work, there's no way you can remember stuff. You had to be able to do it on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh well, well, now when when you when you got that that tag and it was it was a raw. Yeah, and what it was was Earl Earl um, misjudged how far I could. I was supposed to. I, I bang bang. I did something with Booker, and I remember I was supposed to go and blast Bubba off the apron, and I don't know if I caught the back of Earl's shoe, mm. or what it was. But man, I planted my leg, and it was like somebody just took a shotgun and shot my leg out from under me. Because when you tear an ACL, it goes snap, but this one like. <laughs> Mm. And I'm thinking, oh, God, because that's my good knee. You know, I'm thinking, oh, God, I tore my good knee. So I laid down, and I screamed pretty loud because it hurt like hell. I rolled around. I thought, all right, you're screwed because you can't stand on it. Because I tried to get up and finish the match. I couldn't finish it. I don't know how Hunter finished it with his quad. Yeah. But uh, I pushed my leg forward, and my knee was stable. So I was like, what the hell? So the match is finished now, and I'm, I'm just... I, reached around, I reached front and front, and when I hit the front of my leg with that tendon, you know, it's about that long, it goes across and holds the front of your leg, it just went like that. Mm. And I said earlier in the day, I talked to that Gwertz, I, he, he said, no, 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 I said, I said, I said, listen, you little prick. I said, this is exactly how people get hurt, is by doing stuff like this. And Vince assured me, oh, you won't get hurt. I said, I'm not ready. I said, that's why we were supposed to do, I had, me and X-Pac were supposed to go out and do two weeks of tags mm -hmm. to slowly get me in the ring shape. Yeah. Not go out and make a hot tag the first time in an eight, man, I, and stand on the apron for 12 and a half minutes and wait for the hot tag. Yeah. So Vince walked in the locker room, and I'm laying there on this thing, and all the boys are in there, and, you know, doctor comes and looks at it, he goes, he's completely, he's, he's done. I'm 42 at this point, or 41 or 42. I looked up at Vince, and Vince was standing at the door, and he looked at me just as sincerely as he could. He went, like, I'm so sorry. And I said, don't worry, man. I said, this, this ain't, I'll be back. So, you know, I went to, to Birmingham and, you know, and, and rehab for nine months because I still hadn't, the only thing I hadn't done in my career is I hadn't worked with Paul. Mm -hmm. Worked with Sean, I'd worked with Scott. I worked with X-Pac, but I never had done anything with Paul. And Paul, yeah. you know, Paul is one of my dearest friends in the world. So it was just like, I wanted to work with Paul before I was done. And so when I, you know, I got healthy and we had that hell in the cell, which kind of basically solidified what I wanted to do, you know, to prove that I was without a doubt probably the greatest technical wrestler ever to, no question. Ever to hit the mats. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that night I was, I was moving around some guy in Houston stuff. He goes, Jesus Christ, Nash, it took you seven minutes to do that. I said, hey, I got 25. I'm trying to waste it, you know. So you, you got your shot to work with Paul. Yeah, I got my shot to work with Paul, which basically that, that I kind of, you know, and to me, I came back and performed, and I think we outdid that la the year before his bad blood. I think we outperformed by 40 or 50 percent buy rate wise. Probably so. That was that was a good match. It was a good match, and, and, and once again, it proved that psychology is a king to all the, you know, circus shit that these guys think draws money now. At some point after that match, um, it came to an end with the WWE. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was going to do the movie, and they kind of hemmed, hemmed and hawed about, about me doing the Punisher movie. And, you know, I had to cut my hair for the part. Right. And it was just one of those things where just like, I, it, you can't, it, it's, um, it, it is what it is. I'm not saying that it's bad or, or indifferent. It's just that if you work for that company, then mm -hmm. it becomes your life. And I was at a point in my, in my life where, pfft, Number one, when, when I had no money, you didn't tell me what to do, mm -hmm. let alone, you know, I was, you know, 
considered by most people pretty wealthy at this point. So it was just like I was doing investments. My wife was doing real estate. The market that we were in was taking off. We were making money at, on both ends of it. And you know, you make a couple million bucks with Vince for three shots. I mean, I mean, that not, wasn't, it wasn't not, a bad run. Not at I mean, all. I mean, in his eyes, I'm sure it wasn't that great. But for me, I mean, that was. <laughs> Good little piece of business. At the bitter end, or maybe not the bitter end, at the end of that last run, how was it voiced, who communicated with who to say it's over? I think that for them, I mean, they knew that I, I mean, they know that the bottom line with Kevin Nash is his money. Sure. And they knew that they couldn't, I wasn't going to take a pay cut. Yeah. And they were, they didn't feel that they got their money's worth, and, and whether they did or whether they didn't, I mean, just on buy rates alone for that hell in the cell over the year before paid for me that year, or damn near to, you know, close to it. But I looked at it, and, and it was one of those deals I said, well, you know, I said, what, Vince said, what do you want to do? And my neck was real bad. You know, my neck was killing me. I couldn't sleep. I had a bunch of bone spurs in my neck. So I yeah. said, you know, I said, let me go get this my neck cleaned out and see where we're at. So I went, and, I went and had my neck cleaned out, and that re relieved, a, you know, re relieved a lot of the pain I had. But still, it was like I just got to the point where I, w I was so dis disenchanted with the creative mm -hmm. that it didn't. I didn't want to do anything. And then, they, then they offered me, you know, to be with creative, and I said I would. Then the next day, I said I wouldn't, and I just. At that point, I you know I was operated. I got operated on, and I just basically just rode that you know rode that operation out until the contract ran out, and then that was the end of it. I must tell you that personally, I'm thrilled that you're in NWA TNA. But have you ever thought back, maybe that Kevin Nash, as a creative person, in what's now in what's now the WWE, could, you could have made a difference creatively. That's that's where they're the weakest. See, I don't think you can. You know, I, I, there's so many people living in what we call the wrestling bubble. We used to always say, you know, if you if you stand this close to to a, a, a painting, an oil painting, and you say, what do you see? You'll say, I don't know, maybe purple. And you say, well, take a step back. Oh, it's it's lilies and flowers, and it's an open field, and you've got so many people in that company that are in that wrestling bubble that, you know, they're, they're still thinking, that, you know, that that red, white, and blue is the way to go when your two biggest heroes on TV are a corrupt cop on The Shield and a gangster, Tony Soprano. Mm -hmm. The anti-hero. They learned once their again. lesson once, they just can't they, learn it they, again. They, 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 they think that there's going to be some goodness that comes out of this country. You know, that that's what people are going to latch on to. That's not it. And, and Their creative team, at that point there was eight of them, there wasn't one of them I'd go out and have a beer with. Let alone, I mean, they're just not, I'm not saying I'm the hippest guy, but for 45, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty damn hip. And I mean, at 45, they're like, you know. You're not hip enough, get out. Yeah, and they're not hip, they're not even, I mean, I'm hipper than they are, and I'm 45. I'm thinking, my eight-year-old kid's more with it than these guys. What would it take? Is it going to take another anti-hero, a Diesel, a Stone Cold Steve Austin, a Goldberg? Is, it, is that the next big thing? Not Brock Lesnar, obviously, but I don't think I don't think on their on their crew right now. I maybe Batista, but they're already doing to Batista what they did to me. He was a killer. He had an edge. They gave him good one-liners. Then last week he stuck a flag in two guys' asses, which was cutesy, which he wouldn't have done unless he was going to be turning babyface. So they go ahead and they do the exact same thing. Next week he'll have a hard hat on, waving an American flag. Turn a two by four going. Right. There. I mean that and it'll be like, well, what happened to Batista? Well, he didn't carry it. You know, we tried to get him over. It's just like, no, man, you don't understand. It doesn't work. What, in hindsight, to back it up a little bit, would have saved WCW? Now I know you said before that 
the President Kennedy reference that we won't uh, belabor, yeah. but is, was there anything even further back than that? that, the con that the con like I said, though, I mean, you know, people will always, will always refer to you know, the rise and fall of WCW. It was a rise and fall of Time Warner AOL. Yeah. It was an implosion through the entire corporation. Like I said, how was one subsidiary supposed to make it? They were taking funds directly out of us to stop bleeding in other places. They were cutting our funding. They were doing everything that we needed to do to be successful, and we're successful. Those avenues of revenue were being cut on a daily basis. Our expenditure was cut. Things we did while, while Vince was having a milk truck come out and, and shooting beer out of it and all these other th cool things, all of a sudden we're not allowed to do any of that. Plus, we've got to cut back on pyro because it costs 40 grand. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's one of those situations. You either compete or not going to compete. But to, 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 to say that the guys in that locker room were less talented or the guys behind the mm -hmm. cameras were less talented or the guys that were behind the mics were less talented, yeah. It sure is funny how that same crew of guys were able to, so what's the intangible? The intangibles were all still there. The only thing that changed was management changed. What's Kevin Nash's legacy? You've had a, you've had a run of, of 14 years, 15 years, at various degrees of being at the top of the sport in 20 years when there's another wrestle reunion and we bring Kevin Nash in. What are the fans going to say to Kevin Nash? You know what, I really don't care, to be truthful. I mean, to me, it's just like... When I, was, when I was growing up and I was a high school All-American basketball player, I thought that that was the pinnacle of my life. And when I went to college and became a good basketball player in college and, you know, got my choice of the honeys, I thought that was the pinnacle of life. I went over to Europe, played a little ball, hooked up with some honeys over there, thought that was the pinnacle of my life. Got into wrestling, well, strip joints first, hooked up with some honeys, Please, thought that was a hell, and it may have been a pinnacle. That may have been it. But I mean, you know, when you look back at it, it's just like, that's, it's just another, it's 15 years of my life. Hopefully I get I did the next 15, if, if the next 15 are better than, because each, each 15 years or each 10 years is better than the last. So to me, I mean, I look at it as the people that were my friends that I laughed with, they'll know how special it was. The fans, that, the true fans, the people that, that bought my shirts and stood in line in Montreal for four hours to get a, I mean, all those people, the, anybody that comes up to the airport and just looks and goes, I really appreciate what you did. I mean, that, that all makes it, makes it worth, because there's, all of us leave a piece of our body out there every night, and every night we go out there, whether, you know, the smart marks and Meltzer and all these other jack-offs want us, you know, they don't do nothing, you know. To me, all these, all these dirt guys, all they ever do is say, well, how fucking shitty the business is and how this is and how that is. Well, why don't we shut it down and then you see what you can do for a living? Because I find punctuation problems in every paragraph. I mean, they're calling themselves journalists. They write like they're in seventh grade. I mean, come on. Like, they're, telling, they're, telling, they're, telling, they're telling me that I can't work. and they, I mean, they're, they're not even journalists. They can't even write a damn paragraph. Sounds like when when wrestling finally is is closed up for you, you I would you hope right now that I, the reason I'm in TNA is I hope that, that that we can create an alternative for guys to work besides Vince and that we can create competition because competition is the only thing that's going to make this business be successful again and you know like I've had people come up and say well, you know this time maybe you should you should give back maybe you should give back I'm thinking I can barely turn my head. I can't sit down and take a shit without feeling pain in my neck, back, knees, my elbows. My, I, I don't. I don't wake up ever without both my arms asleep. Uh, I, I'm miserable 24 hours a day. I said, well, "How much more? What more are I going to get back?" You don't seem miserable, honestly. Oh, Good-looking guy, you know. God bless me. A little Get bit of honeys. charisma, some honey. No, not anymore. <laughs> I'm with my wife. I'm I, sorry. We'll edit that out. Yeah, also, yeah, nah, just just my wife now, honey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're running out of time, but the last couple of minutes, NWA TNA, you and Scott are back in the top of your game, and quite honestly, haven't looked this good in a long time. What you're doing for uh, the TNA promotion? You know, it's funny because when uh, Scott and I, neither one need money now, so it's like it, it's actually back to when you broke in and you didn't make any money. Yeah. It's wrestling for the sake of wrestling. It's yeah. wrestling because it's fun to do. It's wrestling because it's it's 
Because Scott and I used to always say, you know, you, you get in this business and you're a starving artist, and all of a sudden you make money, and all of a sudden you sign the lithographs. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a chance to actually sit there and once again kind of, and being around Dusty's great, and being around, I mean, Jeff's been a longtime friend, and, yeah. you know, there's a really good mix of old and new there. And Paige is there, too. Page is there. I mean, there's, I've, I've got a lot of my friends there, so to me it's a perfect situation. It's, a, it's fun again. It is fun. Good. Three times a week, I mean, that's about all I can take. <laughs> a little old. What a pleasure it's been to People see People always ask me about McMahon. You didn't ask me what I thought about Vince McMahon. What do you think about Vince McMahon? I think that Vince McMahon is one of the... I, I, he's a, he, I love him. People have always thought that there was heat between us. It's just that he's such an alpha male. Oh, yeah. and, and if you, it, He's a man's man. You either love Vince or you don't love Vince. And I just... I want to say to you, Vince, that no matter what you think, and I know you think I fucked you the last two years because I was hurt so much, but that was my body, it wasn't my heart. So, I'll never come back to work for you, but I just want to tell you that I love you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Whoa, it's always unpredictable with Kevin Nash. Kevin, thank you so much. It's thank great you. to talk to you, and I'm glad you're still back in the business. We, we need you here. For Russell Reunion and for Kevin Nash, I'm Scott. Vivid video. <laughs> video. I'm Scott Hudson. We'll see you next time.